Hearts of Hope there in Marseille, France, as well as some other things that we're going to be hearing about. What would you say if I told you that I hold in my hand the winning Mega Million lottery ticket worth $1.1 billion this week? Okay, the cash option is a measly $550 million, but just imagine what sort of wealth could, uh, what that sort of wealth could do for a person. Actually, you don't even have to imagine what that sort of wealth could do for a person. Let me share with you uh, a few stories from Randy Alcorn's book, Happiness. He tells some stories of people who won the lottery. For example, Charles Riddle won a big lottery in 75. After getting divorced and facing several lawsuits, he was arrested for selling cocaine. William Budd Post won $16.2 million in 1988. He was sued by a former girlfriend who wanted the money, and his brother-in-law hired a hitman, hoping to murder him and inherit the fortune. After a year, he was $1 million in debt and then went to jail for shooting a gun over a bill collector's head. Post called winning the money a nightmare. He died in 2006 after declaring bankruptcy. Jeffrey Dampier won $20 million in 1996 and bought homes for his relatives. Several years later, his sister-in-law and her boyfriend kidnapped him and murdered him to get the money. Billy Bob Harrell Jr. won $31 million in 97. Harrell used the money to purchase a ranch, several homes, and, a, and cars for himself and his family. His spending and lending spiraled out of control, and not long after he divorced, uh, just 20 months after winning, Harrell killed himself with a shotgun. Jack Whitaker won $315 million in 2002. His life after the win involved arrests, shattered relationships, lawsuits, the death of loved ones, including one from a drug overdose. Whitaker's ex-wife later said she wished she'd torn up the ticket. Callie Rogers won $3 million in 2003. 16-year-old Rogers, one of England's youngest winners, spent the money on fancy cars, gifts, lavish vacations, and plastic surgery. An ex-boyfriend got her hooked on cocaine, and she attempted suicide twice. Keith Goff won about $18 million in 2005. He used the money to buy racehorses, and he divorced his wife. It wasn't long before his life started fail falling apart. He was conned by a girlfriend. He developed cirrhosis of the liver from alcoholism and died in 2010. He told a newspaper, my life was brilliant, but the lottery ruined everything. My dreams turned to dust. What's the point of having money when it sends you to bed crying? Abraham Shakespeare won $31 million in 2006. Shakespeare went missing in 2009 after spending most of the money. A few months later, his body was found under a slab of concrete. I know what you're thinking. Those poor people, most of them only won tens of millions. If they'd won 550 million, then that would have been the difference. They would have found happiness. But isn't that the American dream? It doesn't have to be the lottery. It could be investing in that stock or that company that becomes an overnight success and makes you rich. Maybe it's in inventing that one must-have item like the Squatty Potty, which, after appearing on Shark Tank, has resulted in sales of $175 million. Or it's Terry Horton, who stumbled across a painting in a thrift shop in San Bernardino that looked like a paint store threw up on canvas. <laughs> she bought it for $5. Uh, when she had it valued by an expert, he told her it was a Jackson Pollock worth $50 million. That was in 1992. She died in 2018, never having been able to get the money she wanted for it. But isn't that the American dream? A fiscal windfall. All the money you could ever hope for or want. We have this notion that if we just had X amount of dollars, we would be happy. And in spite of the fact that story after story after story shows us to be false, we still keep chasing that ever-elusive bacon Benjamins, cheddar, clams, whatever you want to call it. Back to the question, what if I had the winning ticket? Well, you may be surprised to know that if you look up the biggest lottery winners in Oregon, my home state, number two on that list, coming in at 182.7 million, is Daniel Gannon. That's right. Some of you are thinking Dan's been holding out on us. It's actually my cousin. And no, he never shared any of his winnings with me.
But I can say with a fairly high level of confidence, the winnings did not bring him happiness, certainly not the kind of happiness that lasts, the happiness of God. So if happiness is not found in what has surely been one of the most sought-out sources of happiness throughout the history of the world, money, then where is happiness found? Honestly, this is really the question underlying this entire sermon series. After last Sunday, however, we know where happiness is not found. It is not found in autonomy, that is self-rule, doing whatever I want, as modeled for us by our great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve. In profound contrast to Adam and Eve's example, today we turn our focus to a true source of joy, and that is the Jesus way as we find it in Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12. I invite you to turn to Matthew 5 as you take your sermon outlines from your bulletins. Extras are on the back table. You may recognize Matthew 5 as the beginning of the most famous sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. And you may recall that this sermon begins with some of the most famous, or maybe I should say infamous, words Christ ever preached. Talk about the polar opposite of Adam and Eve's example of seeking happiness in self-rule. Listen to where Jesus says happiness is found. And I'm going to read this morning from the Good News Translation. Jesus saw the crowds and went up a hill where he sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. Happy are those who know they are spiritually poor, the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Happy are those who mourn, God will comfort them. Happy are those who are humble, they will receive what God has promised. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires, God will satisfy them fully. Happy are those who are merciful to others, God will be merciful to them. Happy are the pure in heart, they will see God. Happy are those who work for peace. God will call them his children. Happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Happy are you when people insult you and persecute you and tell all kinds of evil lies against you because you are my followers. Be happy and glad for a great reward is kept for you in heaven. This is how the prophets who lived before you were persecuted. Now, the first thing you probably notice about my reading of today's passage is the word happy in place of blessed. We're going to get to that. But first, I want us to see just how countercultural are Jesus' words here. And I really think that sometimes familiarity breeds contempt when it comes to the words of Christ. And we read them and we go, oh, yeah, we've heard that before. We know what he's talking about. And sometimes Christ's words lose their edge. But I want to convey this morning that what Jesus says in Matthew 5 is edgy. It is countercultural. It would have caused his listeners to scratch their heads in wonderment at what he was saying. I mean, if you think about some of the things that he says, I mean, happy are the poor in spirit mourners, the persecuted, that doesn't sound like happiness to me. I don't know, maybe Adam and Eve's way, seeking autonomy, self-rule, doing whatever I want, maybe that's more appealing. Not only that, but in this age where everyone seems to be clamoring to prove they've had it worse than somebody else, Jesus' words come off as a bit insensitive. Happy? How can I be happy? happy given my upbringing, my poverty, ever-increasing rent. And everyone's just been so unfair to me. One of the songs that come to my mind most often in our culture today is, I've been cheated, been mistreated, when will I be loved? I mean, isn't that our culture? Everyone's clamoring to say, I've been treated worse. I even saw this the other day in an interview with Steph Curry. Steph Curry, an NBA all-star with the Golden State Warriors, may be the greatest shooter of all time. Statistically, he has made more three-pointers than anyone in history. 
Sorry, Sonics fans, that includes Ray Allen, who comes in at second beneath Steph Curry. Yet you know what was emphasized about his story? Can you guess? If you watch any stories, it's how he was a scrawny kid passed over by all the big schools until the coach of Davidson College saw something special. His story is actually the focus of a recently released documentary titled, wait for it, Underrated. I get it. We all love the story of the underdog, the marginalized, the dismissed, the discounted who rise up against all odds to show all those naysayers they're wrong. We love it when the underdog wins. But that's the thing about the Sermon on the Mount. There is no win, at least not on this earth. There's no vindication on this earth for those who are listed there. Do you see that? I mean, it doesn't say, blessed are the poor in spirit, for you're going to win the lottery (laughs) if you just follow Jesus. That's not what it says. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's it. You're going to continue to have hard times, except for the blessings that come for God, otherworldly blessings. There is no get-rich-quick scheme here in Matthew 5. In fact, it's the opposite. Jesus' message is not, follow me, I'll make you rich and famous. It's follow me, and you'll end up poor and persecuted. Make the title, make, I should say, make that the title of your next self-help book, right? Right? And honestly, it's just rude to say to the down and out, be happy. Be happy. But this is Jesus' message. His message here is to capture the offensiveness of his message in his milieu. Modern interpreters must let Jesus' radical demands confront us with all the unnerving ferocity with which they would have struck their first hearers. You see, we as believers who have heard this passage many times before, we may nod our heads and say, that's nice. That's lovely. Jesus' first hearers would have said, hearers, they would have said, what? No. No, Jesus, we want you to be a king who will conquer these oppressors and give us victory, vindicate us in this earth. But that's not what Jesus says, the point Jesus makes is that the very things that his audience would have equated with being cursed are actually the realities reflective of greatest blessings of happiness. But you must understand Jesus' message is only intelligible if you embrace his alternate reality, reality according to the kingdom of heaven. As your first outline point has it, In the Jesus way, kingdom matters, matter most. It is the kingdom that is at the heart, not only of the Beatitudes, but of the entire Sermon on the Mount. The Jesus way is grounded in, centered around, derived from the reality of the forever kingdom of heaven. Jesus' message to his followers is that if they would follow the Jesus way and experience true happiness, the kingdom of heaven must trump their own little man-made kingdoms. Now, I want you to see how the author, that is Jesus, emphasizes the kingdom of heaven. If you look at the first verse of this uh, sermon, verse 3, and then the last verse of the Beatitudes, verse 10, do you see that they are similar? They are bookended, as it were, with the same phrase, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What Jesus does there is he puts emphasis on the kingdom of heaven. He's preaching kingdom realities in the Beatitudes. That is why they seem so strange, because they do not reflect the values of our world. Look at verse 3 again. Blessed, happy are the poor in spirit. How is that happy? How is that blessed? In his classic, The Pursuit of God, famed preacher of old A.W. Tozer says this. He says, these blessed poor are no longer slaves to the tyranny of things. 
They have broken the yoke of the oppressor, and this they have done not by fighting, but by surrendering. Though free from all sense of possessing, they yet possess all things. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Have you noticed that when people talk about oppression in our culture, they're usually talking about those who are keeping the poor from getting what they deserve, money, stuff. But when Tozer talks about the oppressor, he says it is the money, it is the stuff that oppresses us, that we need freedom from. And though we may have little possessions on earth, we possess all things in Christ. Our culture says we've broken the yoke of the oppressor when we stick it to the man and get the wealth we deserve. Jesus says we've broken the yoke of the oppressor when worldly wealth is no longer that which holds sway over us. In heaven's eyes, the poorest wretch with Jesus is richer than any Forbes top 500 member without him. Do you believe that? The problem is our faith is so small that we struggle to embrace kingdom realities. Look at verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. For all of us who have mourned the passing of someone we love, it's hard to see the blessing in it, isn't it? But what is reflected here is something similar to that which Paul states in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. He doesn't say, don't grieve. He says, don't grieve like those who have no hope. You see, when you live under the shadow of the cross, instead of under the shadow of death, you grieve differently because you know that the grave does not spell the end. If death is actually the end, as a materialist or an atheist might advocate, then there is no hope beyond the grave and no reason to hope. But if you belong to the eternal kingdom of God, then death doesn't mark the end but the beginning. It's why I like the euphemisms people have found for a funeral, like celebration of life or homegoing. For those who trust Jesus, death is when our greatest life really begins Certainly we grieve loss, whether it's losing all of our belongings in a fire or losing our health and quality of life due to illness or losing someone we love. But in all these things, we still have happiness because happiness isn't circumstantial. We won't spend a great deal of time on that topic because it was already covered in sermon number six, The Secret to Contentment, Philippians 4. You can see that on our website In general, however, we don't think of the circumstances described here as very positive. For example, verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are the persecuted? So you're saying that the missionary mother and daughter kidnapped in Haiti this week should be happy. Or if I run into her parents, I should say, you should be happy your daughter and granddaughter were kidnapped. Put another way, how often does hashtag blessed follow bad news? Now, since I'm not on social media, I don't really know this. I should have checked with Debbie or or one of you who are on it who know it. Um, Maybe hashtag blessed does follow tragedy. I don't know. But I'm guessing you don't find a lot of people posting things like my dog died, hashtag blessed. I got canned, hashtag blessed. Or I gained 20 pounds this year, hashtag blessed. In the Netflix hit Stranger Things, there is an alternate reality that they call the upside down. It's a reality that mirrors the normal world, but it's twisted and full of monsters. I don't think it's a great stretch to say that Jesus' original audience, upon hearing this sermon, would have seen the reality Jesus was preaching is upside down. 
as twisted, even monstrous. It's likely most of those listening to Jesus as he preached on that hillside were the poor, were the marginalized, were the oppressed. You think they wanted Jesus to tell them they should be happy? Are you getting a sense for just how radical, how countercultural, how offensive the Beatitudes would have been for his hillside audience? But here's a thought. What if the norms we encounter in this world, what if those norms are actually the upside down? And what if the truths that are taught in Scripture about the kingdom of God, what if that was the right side up? True reality. What if true blessings aren't based on how great your circumstances are in this world? What if true blessings are grounded in our unshakable hope in Christ and his kingdom? This is Jesus' mind-blowing message. For those who enjoy the hope of eternal life, there really isn't anything that can rob us of that which is the source of greatest joy, greatest happiness. Isn't this exactly what we sang this morning in John Wesley's classic, O Four Thousand Tongues to Sing? He speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive, the mournful broken hearts rejoice, the humble poor believe. By the way, I need to tell you there was a change last week to today's service. We weren't supposed to sing this song or that lyric, and it had nothing to do with what I was preaching, but God's timing is always perfect that we should sing these words inspired by Matthew 5 on the Sunday I'm preaching from Matthew 5. The point is that mournful, broken hearts really do have a reason to rejoice. We have joy in spite of difficult things, which brings us back finally to the question raised earlier, is it appropriate to translate the word blessed or blessed with the word happy in the Beatitudes? Before I answer that, I feel I should revisit the confession I made at the beginning of the series uh, in his book, Happiness, Randy Alcorn calls to account preachers who portray happiness as something inferior to joy, as if happiness was just a worldly state while joy is spiritual and godly. And if you haven't heard me say this before, then I'll say it today. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I have actually preached sermons where I've said the very thing that happiness is inferior and joy is spiritual. I was wrong. That was incorrect. <laughs> Alcorn argues that this distinction is simply not biblical, and you know what? He's right. We don't see it in Scripture, so let me say it again in case you missed it. I was wrong to have ever said otherwise. Again, as we discuss this book as, as pastors, we were all convicted of this false distinction between joy and happiness, yet it was because of this misunderstanding that in previous sermons on the Sermon on the Mount, that I actually, when I heard someone say, happy are the poor in spirit, I was like, blessed is what it says. It says blessed, not happy. What's wrong with you? Happy. Huh. Uh, but again, I have to eat my words and say today, Blessed means happy. To be more precise, translating the Greek word for blessed in Matthew 5 as happy is a valid translation. It's a good translation. In the past, I've turned up my nose at such translations. In fact, some of my favorite theologians also question happy as a translation here, not because of the meaning, but because the word in pop culture might be viewed as some sort of shallow emotional state. But in terms of translation decisions, it must be recognized that the word blessed is at least as likely to be misunderstood. What do people understand the word blessed to mean? We don't have to wonder because Randy Alcorn did a Facebook poll on the word blessed, asking what comes to mind when you hear the word blessed or blessed. He got 1,100 responses, many of which were well off the mark. Uh, and he gives a sampling in his book. Things going well is what blessed means. By the way, that's the opposite of what Jesus is saying here, right? Someone who has it all and has had an easy life. Talented, privileged. Having my needs met. A showering of mercies from God. Being protected by God. To have something others want. 
Before I knew God, I thought blessed was creepy, like a cult term. Some kind of anointing to be set apart, holy. By the way, that's good to be set apart and holy. That's not what blessed means, or certainly not what this word uh, in, in the Greek here means. Disguised bragging, as in, look at my new expensive car. I'm so blessed. Being comfortable, a vaguely positive churchy word. As I mentioned early on in this sermon series, the negative view of the word happy has really only come about in the last 100 years or so. In fact, I love what prolific British preacher and author C. Campbell Morgan from the late 1800s has to say about translating blessed, happy in the Sermon on the Mount. This esteemed biblical scholar writes, there is a general consensus of opinion that the word most accurately expressing the meaning here is the word happy rather than blessed. He goes on to write, happiness is God's will for man. That is the divine intention for human life. Sorrow and sighing are to flee away, right? You know the song, no, sorrow and sighing will flee away. It says, no, he will wipe away all tears. Happiness and joy are never to flee away. We will never banish merriment and laughter. Happy is the first word of the manifesto, is a word full of sunshine, thrilling with music, brimming over with just what man is seeking after in a thousand false ways. He uses the word manifesto because he considers the Sermon on the Mount to be Jesus' kingdom manifesto. Am I the only one when I heard the, hear the word manifesto, I think communist manifesto. I mean, that's just what pops into my head. But what a great picture. Jesus' kingdom manifesto is the polar opposite of the communist manifesto. What Morgan emphasizes is the fact that the very first word in Jesus' kingdom manifesto, that's what he's calling Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, the very first word is happy. So if you've bought into the notion that Christianity is some woe is me, look at what a martyr I am kind of religion, think again. At the center of Christianity is happiness. G. Campbell Morgan rightly points out that even in his day, a hundred years ago, people were seeking out happiness in a thousand false ways. But that's really the point Jesus is making in Sermon on the Mount, isn't it? He purposely focuses on something he knows all of us want, which is happiness. Everyone wants to be happy. Even, I would argue, even those who seem to want to be unhappy are doing it because they think it's going to make them happy. I don't know. Figure that out. Let me know if you agree with me later. He purposely focuses on something he knows we all want, happiness, but then tells us it is grounded in heaven, grounded in the kingdom, grounded in God, as Morgan goes on to write, then we notice that happiness is declared by the king to depend not on doing, not on possessing, but on being. It is what a man is that matters. The communist manifesto is all about possessing and doing. The kingdom manifesto is about being. It's who you are that matters. It is kingdom over cash, character over climbing, Conviction over clickbait. By climbing there, I'm thinking of climbing the corporate ladder or whatever else kind of climbing that you do to get better in this world, to have nicer stuff or whatever it is that you, everyone's aiming for. Conviction over clickbait. You know clickbait. The images on a website, you find that tempt us by means of our selfish desires, but they eventuate in computer viruses or garbage websites or separating you from your money. This world is filled with clickbait. What is valued in the kingdom, however, is conviction. You'll notice that a number of these beatitudes actually emphasize character and conviction. Look at verse 5. It says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are the, those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Happiness is grounded in who we are as people of the kingdom, of character, of conviction, who are merciful, meek, and peaceable toward others, and who hunger for righteousness and purity in heart in our walk with God. It's because happiness is grounded in who we are as people of God that theologian John Wesley, brother of hymn writer Charles Wesley, wrote, Every Christian is happy. He who is not happy is not a Christian. That's a pretty strong statement. Now, I don't think Wesley, writing in the 1700s, is saying that Christians are to be perpetually bubbly. That's not what he's saying. What he's indicating is that those who have encountered and been transformed by the living Christ have a source of joy and gladness that is greater than anything this world has to offer. Wesley goes on to define substantial or define this happiness, which begins when we come to Christ as happiness real, solid, substantial. Now, by the way, does that sound like the way that sometime preachers have defined happiness? Oh, this superficial thing. No, it's real in Christ. It's substantial. It's solid. What a contrast to the up and down, here one day, gone the next kind of happiness our world offers. I want to share with you a tragic but a very telling story about the elusiveness of the worldly pursuit of happiness as found in Randy Alcorn's book by the same name. He says, psychotherapist Lynn Rosen and motivational speaker John Liddig co-hosted an hour-long radio show on WBAI in New York called The Pursuit of Happiness. But this Brooklyn couple, their final act was putting plastic bags over each other's heads and committing suicide. Rosen and Liddig were experts in pursuing happiness, but failures at catching it. This tragic couple epitomizes the irony that the more we advertise and purchase products, events, and books intended to make us happy, the unhappier we become. So we return to the question, what version of happiness are you and I pursuing? Is it a version like that which Jesus presents in his kingdom manifesto, the Sermon on the Mount? Or is it a version more like the endless pursuit of more stuff and adventures in hopes that they are going to make us happy? As you contemplate those questions, listen as I read the last two verses of today's passage, verses 11 and 12. Happy are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Bless you. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Again, the question is, Whose example are we following as Christians? And you know the reason I'm asking that question is because I know I struggle to remember whose example I'm supposed to be following. Do you struggle? Is it wealth and success that are keys to experiencing happiness? whether it's vesting lots of money in lotto tickets or investing ourselves in the daily grind in hopes of a comfortable retirement. Again, whose example are we following? Do you know the name Jack Higgins? I want to actually see. How many know the name Jack Higgins? No one? One person. That is so sad because Jack Higgins was a successful author who wrote 85 novels, sold more than 250 million copies, and has been translated into 55 languages, I would say that's a successful writer. Yet in spite of all of his success, listen to his wish. He says, I wish somebody had told me that when you get to the top, there's nothing there. Contrast that example with the example of a well-known missionary, Amy Carmichael. Alcorn writes about her, Our model should be people such as Amy Carmichael, 1867 to 1951, who brought the gospel to countless children she rescued from temple prostitution in India. 
She experienced a great deal of physical suffering and never had a furlough in her 55 years as a missionary. Yet she wrote, There is nothing dreary and doubtful about life. It is meant to be continually joyful. We are called to a settled happiness in the Lord whose joy is our strength. Continually joyful? A woman who lived in virtual poverty in India? Yep. Because she embraced the Jesus way. As we conclude this look at Jesus' way this morning, I would like to read through the Beatitudes one more time. As I do so, I invite you to prayerfully ask yourself as you hear them, which of these Beatitudes do I most need growth in? Maybe I hear some of the ones poor in spirit mourn and I think about my own situation. And maybe it's that I need to, instead of being filled with self-pity, maybe I need to be filled with hope in the kingdom, the comfort that comes from the spirit. Or maybe as you hear some of the more ethically focused ones like meekness and hunger and thirsting for righteousness, mercy, being pure in heart, peacemakers, maybe you think there's one of those I could use a little more of. I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, by the way, this is a great passage to memorize. If you want a simple application of this passage, just memorize Jesus' words. Maybe put the word happy in instead of blessed, but whatever you prefer. Uh, but I'll tell you, Friday night, I was out late at night uh, covering up some things in the backyard because I heard the rains are coming. Um, and so I was out in the backyard. And, of course, whenever it's late at night and I'm in the backyard, I turn to prayer. It's just automatic uh, being out in God's creation. And my thoughts turned immediately to Matthew 5. And you know what I was praying I was praying about the ways that I had failed Matthew 5 on Friday. I was kind of looking like, oh, you know, I'm supposed to be these things? Hmm. You know, there are some convicting things in here for us, I believe, as, as believers, as followers of Jesus. Tough things. These are hard things. These are hard. If, if you're not reading them as hard, then you don't understand what Jesus is saying because this is really hard. I just invite you, as I read these words, ask yourself, which of these things apply to you right now that God would have you work, work on in your life by the power of the Holy Spirit? Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Happy are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Happy are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Happy are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Happy are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Happy are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Just take a moment, a few moments of silent prayer right now, and then I'll close us. great God in heaven. We give you thanks this morning that you offer us a happiness which this world does not know about, a happiness that only comes from you, a happiness of a different way of life, happiness that is grounded in your kingdom. God, we confess that too often we find ourselves following the example of our world 
and its views of happiness rather than your word and what we're taught here in scripture. But Lord, we pray that you'll help each of us as your followers more and more to pursue the Jesus way, to find happiness not in the things that we do or the things we possess, but in who we are, the hope that we have in you. Jesus, thank you so much for this hope that is deep, that is unending, that is unshakable. Help us as we leave this place to live in that hope and to reflect the happiness that is described in these verses. We pray it in Christ's precious name. And all the people said, amen. I invite you to stand for our benediction that comes this morning from the last words we find in the book of Philemon. And this is what it says. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen.